Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over hypophosphatemia. Now in my other video I went over hyperphosphatemia, so if you want to watch that video be sure to check that out. So in this video what I want to do is I'm going to cover the causes, the signs and symptoms, and the nursing interventions. And I'm going to highlight those key concepts that you need to know for NCLEX exam and your nursing lecture exams. And then I'm going to give you clever mnemonics on how to remember this material so it sticks with you. Now after you watch this video be sure to go to my website registerednursern.com and take the free quiz that will test your knowledge on hyper and hypophosphatemia. Now, now a card should be popping up or a link in the description below so you can access that free quiz. So let's get started. Okay, as I do in all my fluid and electrolyte videos, I like to break down these big words so we know what electrolyte we are dealing with. Okay, so the first part is hypo. Hypo means below and phosphate means it's a prefix for phosphate. So hey, we are dealing with phosphate and we know that it's low. Anemia means blood, so put all that together and you get low phosphate in the blood. So what is a normal phosphate level? It is 2.7 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter and anything less than 2.7 is considered hypophosphatemic, so low phosphate. Okay, in order to understand these causes and why you're seeing these signs and symptoms in these patients with these low phosphate levels, you have to know how phosphate works in the body, where it's stored, who, what system of the body excretes it, and things like that, because all of it will make sense. Okay, phosphate plays a huge role in building your bones and your teeth. So if you have issues with low phosphate, you are at risk for broken bones and your teeth. And it plays a vital function in muscle and nerve function. So that is why you're going to see your um, reflexes not responding appropriately or the muscles being weak. Things like that whenever you have low or high phosphate levels. Okay, now it is mainly stored in the bones phosphate. So that's again why you're going to see your bone fractures because you're going to, the body is going to waste all of its phosphate and it's going to be low and that's hard on your bones. And another thing, commit this to memory. The kidneys and the parathyroid regulate your phosphate levels. So if you are in renal failure or you have parathyroid problems like in hypo or hypoparathyroidism, you are going to have some messed up phosphate levels and calcium levels, which hits on my next point. Calcium and phosphate influence each other in opposite ways. And what I mean by that is if you have a high calcium level, chances are you're going to have a low phosphate level and vice versa. They're constantly doing the opposite of each other. And I talk about in my um, calcium electrolyte videos about this. And another thing, also commit this to memory, vitamin D plays a huge role, just like it did in calcium, with the absorption of phosphate. So if you have low vitamin D levels, you're going to have probably low phosphate levels. If you've taken too much vitamin D, probably going to have high phosphate levels because it helps with absorption. Okay, the causes of hypophosphatemia. Okay, to remember this, commit to memory the word phosphate because we're dealing with electrolyte phosphate and just try to remember low phosphate. So every letter of phosphate is going to correlate with a cause. So let's get started. Okay, P. P stands for pharmacy, drugs. Drugs can cause this. Specifically, your aluminum hydroxide base and magnesium base antacids. And how they do this is whenever a person takes those, it will mess up how your GI system absorbs phosphate. So it causes malabsorption, which will make it where you're not going to take in any phosphate through your food. And another thing is the lack of vitamin D. Because remember at the beginning I talked about how vitamin D helps you absorb phosphate. So if you have low levels or you're not taking enough supplements, this can affect your ability to absorb the phosphate. Okay, H for hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid, like we talked about earlier, plays a huge role in regulating the calcium and phosphate levels. And the parathyroid releases a hormone called PTH, the parathyroid hormone. And in this state, there's too much secretion of your parathyroid. 
hormone. And the parathyroid, whenever it's normal, it plays a role in regulating those calcium and phosphate levels, and it normally inhibits the reabsorption of phosphate to keep those levels nice and balanced. But whenever you have too much of the parathyroid hormone being released, this totally inhibits the reabsorption of phosphate by your kidneys. So what's happening is that you're just wasting all that phosphate through your urine and you're not absorbing any of it. Okay, so next one, O, onconogenic osteomalacia. This is where the kidneys start to waste FOSS, and this decreases your phosphate levels, and you start having softening of the bones. This can be due to a malignancy, maybe some, maybe cancer, things like that. Okay, to S. S stands for syndrome of refeeding, also called refeeding syndrome, and this is really important, so remember this. This is typically seen in patients who are started on TPN, which is the total parental nutrition. And what happens is that these patients have been really malnutritioned or they've um, been experiencing starvation and all of a sudden the body who has went into survival mode gets this nutrition, the food, or whatever you give them and all of a sudden their body releases insulin due to the increased blood sugar and in order to synthesize that the the body is starting to release phosphate and magnesium and um, potassium which was already low and depleted to begin with to help synthesize all that and then all of a sudden it like bottoms your phosphate levels out so you will see that refeeding syndrome in really severe malnutrition patients. So watch for that. Okay, next is P for pulmonary issues. Patients who are experiencing respiratory alkalosis. And this is due to um, all of a sudden because of these different, Im this imbalance, the FOSS has moved out from the blood into the cell. And I talk about this with osmosis in my hypertonic, hypotonic video, but that's what's happened. It's all left the blood and went into the cell, went in respiratory alkalosis. And then H, hyperglycemia. Um, this is because the patient is experiencing uh, gluco, glucose urea, polyuria, and ketoacidosis. So they're urinating a lot, they're wasting a lot of glucose, and this causes the kidneys to also waste phosphate. Okay, next, A for alcoholism. Alcohol has a really big effect on the body's ability to absorb phosphate. So they're going to have, so they're not going to be able to absorb the phosphate because they're taking in alcohol. And also, patients who do have issues with alcoholism are already malnutrition, so they already are depleted of all those essential electrolytes. So they are definitely at risk for that. And T for thermal burns. This is whenever a patient has extreme burns all over the body. This is due to the shifting of the FOSS out from in the blood into the cell. So it's causing all that shifting and the FOSS levels are going to drop in the blood. And then E for the last one, electrolyte imbalances. Remember um, how we were talking about if you have a high calcium, you'll have a low FOSS. Other imbalances of other electrolytes can also cause low FOSS levels such as hypercalcemia, which I just said, um, hypomagnesiemia, low mag levels can cause also a low phosphate level, and hypokalemia, low potassium, can also cause low FOSS level. So now let's look at the signs and the symptoms. To help you remember the signs and symptoms of hypophosphatemia, remember the word broken because this patient is at risk for bone fractures, breaking their bones because phosphate plays a huge role in bone health. And every system of the body is breaking down because of this low phosphate level. You have the immune system being affected, respiratory system, the neuro system, everything. So for B, remember breathing problems. They're having breathing problems. They're not able to breathe well due to muscle weakness because whenever you breathe, your muscles help you take in and out air. R, rhabdomyolysis. This is caused by an electrolyte disturbance. This is where you're having low um, levels of phosphate, potassium, things like that, and it stresses the body out. And what happens is it actually affects the muscles, and it causes rapid necrosis of the muscles, so the muscles are just breaking down. And whenever this happens, when the muscle dies, it releases myoglobulin 
into the blood and this stuff is very toxic to the kidneys so whenever the kidneys get a hold of this they start to shut down and they and the patient's urine will look tea colored remember that with this condition you will have tea colored urine and the patient will start complaining of muscle weakness and pain so remember those concepts and the other r for this is that the deep tendon reflexes will be decreased Okay, O to osteomalacia. This is again the softening of the bones. So you may all of a sudden see that this patient is starting to have more bone fractures or their bones are deformed, they're shaped weird. Um, and also they will have cardiac output, the other O, decrease. Their heart won't be pumping as efficiently. Okay, K for kills immune system. This has a huge effect on the immune system by suppressing it. And whenever this happens, you start to have decreased platelet aggregations and your platelets are what get together and they help to form clots, which helps you from bleeding. And so you will start to see increased signs of bleeding in this patient. Next E for extreme weakness, they will be weak and tired. They will have, um, they may have ecchymosis. And this is again due to those decreased platelets platelets. And then in for neuro changes, they will be all of a sudden confused, irritable, and they may have seizures. So you want to put them in seizure precautions. Okay, so what are you going to do for this patient as the nurse? What are some things that you need to know, especially for NCLEX and lecture exams? Okay, know that um, most doctors may order some oral phosphorus with vitamin D. Remember why are they ordering vitamin D with the phosphorus? Because it helps absorb the phosphorus. So remember that. And watch patients who are on TPM. We talked about this earlier because they may be getting rhabdomyolysis and they will have the muscle pain and the muscle weakness and also the refeeding syndrome. Watch out for that because those patients are at risk for that because of the phosphate levels messing up. Next, ensure patient safety. Make sure you're putting the bed down, the call light in reach, because this patient is at risk for bone fractures and they have confusion. And next, encourage foods rich in phosphate. And remember these foods, because as I say all the time, exams love to throw out, which foods are the most rich in phosphate? The patient has a phosphate level of 2.2, what would you give them to eat? So fish, organ meats, nuts, pork, chicken, beef, whole grains are all good. So any really meats, remember that, are good. Okay, now if the phosphate levels are less than one milligram per deciliter, sometimes the physician will order you to give IV phosphate. And things you wanna keep in mind, make sure before you give this that the patient um, renal status is good, their BUN creatinine is normal because patients who are in renal fail failure, which we talk in hyperphosphatemia video, um, they do not do good with phosphate because they cannot clear that. So you don't want to give someone who's in renal failure phosphorus because it'll really mess things up. So watch that. Um, watch the calcium level because again, calcium, if you're trying to increase the phosphate level, the calcium level can decrease. So you want to watch and monitor for signs of hypocalcemia and um, look for that. And then next, make sure you're monitoring the phosphate levels because all of a sudden you can send them too high. So you want to look for signs of hyperphosphatemia and any EKG changes. So you want to have them on a cardiac monitor watching those levels. Okay, so that is a little bit about hypophosphatemia. Now go to my website, registerednursern.com and take the free quiz to test your knowledge on how well you grasp this material. And be sure to check out my other videos on electrolyte imbalances and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.